But we come to the Torah portion, but a sheet. When, with this portion, we're beginning a new Torah cycle. And when we begin a, a new Torah cycle, we're reminded of very important principles that we see throughout our lives. And one of those is that at the end of one cycle, we see simultaneously the beginning of another. When we come to the end of one season, simultaneously we're going to begin another season. And I'm going to recommend to you, and it is yet to be seen just how accurate this is, but I'm going to suggest to you that just as 9 10, 2001 was a world that we will never see again because when we woke up the next day, everything was different, right? I'm gonna recommend to you that in some similar way, when we got up last Shabbat, we had exited one season and we were going into another. We shall see, we shall see. But in Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse one, to everything there is a season. There is a time for every purpose under heaven. As I've, we've shared that many, many, many times, every season has a reason. Good seasons have a reason. Bad seasons have a reason. Everything serves a purpose. And so that season that comes and then goes and the next one begins, all of these things work hand in glove with the Father's purpose for everything and for everyone. And so we are now passing from summer into autumn and then eventually we'll pass from autumn into winter and eventually spring. And those changes in the season, we see the evidence of it and that lets us know what time of the year it is and when we should plant, when we should harvest, When's not a good time to plant in January is not the best time around here. So we need to pay attention to the seasons as, as the creator gives us evidence of what season we're in. Because whatever he's doing, that's what we need to be doing. Whatever he's involved with, that's what we need to be focused on and not be working against him. So there, there's that. It helps us, or seasons helps us to know what's going on around us and what to do in those seasons. And we're also reminded with this new Torah cycle that in order to understand the present, we have to understand the past. In Ecclesiastes chapter three again, verse 15, that which is has already been and what is to be has already been. And God requires an account of what is past, which is just a way of saying that he... He works things out that what we're seeing going on right now, he works it out that you can find precedent for it in the past, in a manner of speaking. Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. So that says to me, if you really want some hardcore evidence that I'm the Lord and there is no other, go back and look at things that have been. Because when you look at things that have been, here's what you're going to find that those things are standing right now. Those things are continuing right now. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Not that he predicts the end from the beginning, but he tells us the end by telling us the beginning. If you want to understand the end, you have to understand the beginning. If you want to decipher the book of Revelation, starting in the book of Revelation is not the best place to start. The book of Genesis, but a sheet. So then, um, you know, I've been deliberating all week about what to say today. I mean, <laughs> I mean, there were people, you know, and I want to say this respectfully, um, live stream audience, some of them, um, are we going to have service? Are we going to, what are we going to do? And all I know to do is what I know to do. To, to, can, to continue doing what the Father has called us to do, right? Until he tells us something otherwise. So I've been deliberating about what to speak on. And one of the first thoughts that come to me was this. Last Shabbat morning, when we woke up and we were surprised, and apparently the IDF was surprised, guess who was not? He was not taken by surprise will not be taken by surprise in anything that happens. He knows all these things. He knew these things. And here is something that's very difficult for us to grapple with. He didn't stop certain things from happening. He didn't stop it. He allowed things to, to unfold. So he's not taken by surprise. 
And so I believe that, given the events of this past week, coming into this renewal, the Torah cycle, and coming into this Torah portion, there's got to be something in this Torah portion that speaks to us about right here, right now. All right? So I want to look at some principles that we see in the Torah portion called Breshit. Now, I need to also say this. In these first, you know, five chapters and a few verses of chapter six, I mean, all of the mysteries of the universe are embedded in there somehow. It's just that the creator decided just to give us the highlights of certain things. And so there is so much that we could discuss, and I'm sure that many of us would love to discuss, you know, on and on and on and on. But we're just going to hit some of the highlights of things, look at some principles and how they apply to us today. So let's start at the beginning. Bereshit chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and choshech, darkness. Darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, which is to say that the Spirit of God was there in the midst of that darkness, hovering over the waters. So that's very important, I think. So in Burashit, or in the beginning, here's what we need to understand, that from Burashit, everything comes out of that. All the other books of Moses, Joshua, Judges, the prophets, the major, the minor prophets, all the Psalms, the Proverbs, the Gospels, the writings of Paul and Peter and James and John, even the book of Revelation, all of that comes out of Burashit. Because Burashit is the seed from which all things come those things that are physical, and those things that are spiritual. We're going to be able to find them in some form or fashion back in the beginning, back in the garden. And so like a seed will contain um, all of a plant or all of a tree and all the things that are associated with it, the fruit, the foliage, the branches, all those things, everything is contained in that seed. Likewise, everything that has happened and will happen Somehow, some way, we find it in the beginning. Because in the beginning when it says, and God created the heavens and the earth, I believe, in those words is summed up some things that we can't even begin to comprehend and imagine. But boiling it down, it's this. When God created the heavens and the earth, he created everything that was needed for the creation to function. Even though in that instant, it was not in its ultimate form. All right? So, the basic elements, fire, wind, water, earth, all these things were there. But I'm going to recommend to you also things like patterns, precepts, even prophecy. All those things were there as well. Everything that we comprehend was there in the beginning. Everything that we don't comprehend was there in the beginning. Again, maybe not in its ultimate form in the way that we would recognize it. But just like that seed contains everything in time, according to the season, all those things will come to fruition. So everything we comprehend was there. Everything that we don't comprehend related to the physical world was there. And all of those things were created out of nothing. Because prior to creation, there was nothing but the glory of God. That's why it's called Ensof. One of the reasons he's called Ensof. There is no end. He has no beginning. He has no end. He, he, he can't be put in a box. We can't comprehend that. And so he's called Ensof, the glory of God. How do we comprehend that? That's what existed. So it's difficult for us, or at least it's difficult for me to comprehend nothing as we understand that. Because as long as I've been around, there's always been something. So I... I just can't wrap my brain around that. But by nothing, I mean there was no sun, no moon, no stars. At, at a certain point, there wasn't even light or darkness. There was just the glory of God. However, that being said, and we just read it, darkness is one of the first things that we see mentioned in the creation account. God created the heavens and the earth, and choshech, darkness, was upon the face of the deep. We should not assume that darkness is equivalent to the absence of light. But, and we do that because of our own physical experience, you know, what we can relate to. That's what we equate it to. However, Isaiah 45 says, the creator speaks and says, I form the light, 
I create darkness. I do these things. My point is, we might assume that before he started doing anything, it was just darkness. No, he created that. It's one of the first things that he created, darkness. So here's my point. If you wanna understand the end, you have to first understand the beginning. And in the beginning, before there's a mention of light, guess what? There's darkness. So if there was choshek, darkness, in the beginning, should we not expect that there will be darkness at the end? And so now I'm speaking of spiritual darkness. If there was darkness in the beginning, then you and I should not be surprised if we believe that we're living at the end, that darkness is going to be upon the world and upon the nations. And when we see that, and we've known this for a long, 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 long time, but when we're reminded in very dramatic fashion like we were last weekend that this darkness is real and it's agitated and it's offensive and it's on the move and pervasive and all these things, we shouldn't be shocked and surprised. If it was in the beginning, it's gonna be in the end. But being children of the light, we should not be taken unawares, right? Right? Not if we're being sober and alert and as we should be. Also, this darkness was upon the face of the deep, the waters that covered the earth. And scripture on several different places uses the waters or the seas to represent the nations. So my point is, if it was that way in the beginning, should we not expect that in the end, darkness will be pervasive among the nations? Here's a passage to back up what I'm saying. Isaiah 60, verse one through three. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness might cover the earth. <laughs> no, that's not the word, right? For behold, the darkness, by the way, choshech is the word. Choshech, the same word used to describe what we see in the beginning. Choshech shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. So what do we see here? It's going to happen. But the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you and the nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. So number one, this prophecy in Isaiah 60 is a prophecy concerning Zion. It's a prophecy concerning the restoration of Israel, of Yerushalayim, and its people, because Zion is more than just a place. Zion is a mindset. It is a people, which, by the way, through Yeshua the Messiah, you and I have become part of that people. We're part of that mindset. We're part of that movement. He's building up Zion right now, all right? That's what's happening right now. So that's very important. But if this is a prophecy rep, um, about the restoration of Israel, about the restoration of Zion, I want you to notice the season. What's the environment? Darkness. Choshech. A time of great darkness. So again, as his people, as children of the light, we should not be surprised by this. Doesn't mean we like it, doesn't mean it's fun, doesn't mean we enjoy it, doesn't mean we're, you know, necessarily can predict every little thing that happens, but we should not be taken by surprise when we see another demonstration of the darkness that comes upon the earth. But we also want to notice this, that it's during the darkness that God calls forth the light. It's during that darkness when his glory rises among you or upon you. It's that time in the darkness when we are called to arise and shine. So it's in the darkness that he calls forth the light. This is what we see in the beginning. Chapter one, verse three. Then God said, let there be light. And there was a light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So the word called, it's the word yikra. 
Yud, Kuf, Resh, Aleph, Yikra. The book of Leviticus is called Vayikra. Yikra, and he called. That same word. And this word Yikra, it denotes summoning. And so it, it wasn't that he just said, oh, I think I'll invent light. No, that's not what the word is implying. The word is implying that he called to the light. He summoned the light to appear, suggesting what? That the light was already there. It just wasn't manifest. I want you to think about that. He didn't, you know, just, ta-da, there's light. He summoned it. He called to it. He called for the light that was already present, yet not manifest, to be manifest. And where? In the midst of the darkness. And we're not talking about the light of the sun. That doesn't come until day four. We're talking about the light of creation, which is hinting at Yeshua the Messiah, who is the light of the world, right? So if he was in the beginning, we know he's going to be in the end because he's the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the Aleph and the Tav, right? All right. But the one who is the light of the world said to his people, you are the light of the world. So can I recommend to you that when we see darkness such as this, that at the same time we should hear this voice that is summoning the darkness, calling to the, um, excuse me, calling to the light to be manifest. And so, going back to something we said earlier, when the devil goes on a rampage and all these bad things happen, that is not the time for us to cower in a corner. That is the time for us to get front and center and sing and dance and praise and shout and, and, pro and proclaim that the God of Israel is God to be that light in the midst of the darkness. Just to kind of underscore that statement I made a moment ago, there is a rabbinical belief that the light of creation was always there. It just had to be manifest. Interesting. At this point in Genesis chapter 1, the earth was considered to be tohu vevahu. I'm going to use these words, unformed and desolate. Unformed and desolate. I think the way I, it's uh, rendered here, let me find it, was without form and void, okay? But unformed and desolate. Now, personally, I do not take that to mean it was chaotic. Some people read in, oh, at that point in time, everything in creation is chaotic. I don't read it that way. I read it that it was unformed and desolate. Unformed like a baby, when it is first conceived in its mother's womb, is unformed. But it's alive, isn't it? And it has everything it needs, or he or she has everything they need to become the man or the woman that God created them to be. We can't count fingers and toes at that instant, but we know it's a baby. We know it's alive. Because the creator saw to it that it has everything it needs to eventually become that man or that woman. So that's what I see. The earth was unformed. It, was in its, it wasn't in its final state, as it were. But everything was there that was needed in order for it to be everything that God created it to be. It was desolate. What does that mean? Well, there, weren't no, there were no people. And why did God create the earth? To be inhabited with and not just any people, <laughs> his people, his people. He never intended for the field in which he sowed wheat to be taken over by tares. That's why at the end he uproots the tares and gathers the wheat into his farm. Now, that idea might be offensive to some. But you'll have to take it up with the creator of the universe. He's the one who created it. It's his. He can do with it what he wants, how he wants, when he wants. Take it up with him. But at that point, the earth was unformed. It wasn't in its final form. And it was desolate. There were no people. 
I don't believe it was chaotic, in other words. But even if it was chaotic, then we need to understand this. When God begins to speak, he brings order into chaos. And order is something that mankind resists. It is in our nature to resist order. We don't like it. Now, I know that some people, yes, I want structure, I want order, until somebody brings order to you. That goes for me too. Because when somebody points out chaos in my life, that I need to do something to bring order in my life, my first is, I go on the defense. You do it too. Every one of us do it to some form or fashion. And mankind as a whole resists order. We have a Bible that we can read story after story after account after account that tells us how man resists order. But that's what the creator was doing. He was bringing order into this situation. So then if that was happening in the beginning, might it be that he is going to, and through his people, bring order into the chaos that certainly is going on in the world today. Now, to bring order to a situation takes work. He worked six days on it. So it takes work. It takes hard work. And since we see that man typically resists order, we shouldn't be surprised that in our family, in our congregation, in our world, those who are equipped and appointed to bring order to the chaos, we shouldn't be surprised to find that people are going to fight back against that. People are going to resist that. And we're also going to find that in, in an effort to ensure that his purposes stay on track and to bring order, sometimes bad stuff has to happen. Y'all still with me? The creation account describes the formation, the taking shape of God's purpose. It gives us the major category of events. It doesn't tell us every little detail because if it told us every little detail, we wouldn't be sitting around at Midrash and trying to figure out how all this happened. Right? There wouldn't be all these books about all these different things. But it gives us highlights, but in terms of his perspective, not so much ours from his perspective. And so then, seeing that it's highlights from his perspective, we on this side of things, we look at it with just with awe. It's just this huge mystery. But the creation account is given to us, one thing we can discern. It's given to us to establish in our minds, in our hearts, in our spirit, that the God of the Bible is the creator of all things. And all things were created for his purpose. And so then, as we go on into this, we see that more than just being a history of how things happen, what we should come away with is seeing that it's a description of why things happen. In other words, why did he do all this? Not so much how, not the form necessarily, but the why, the function of it. What was the purpose of it? Because, well... He wanted it to be inhabited with his people, right? Ultimately, and so that he could dwell among his people. That was a big why creation is. But embedded in this, as we go through the account, are all these principles, these prophecies that I refer to. Now, notice that we just read that when he called the, he summoned the light and he called the light day and the darkness he called night, he saw that the light was good. In Hebrew, kitov. We sing a song. I forgot the words. <laughs> You're right. That was the one. All right. Kitov. It was good because that which fulfills his will is good. And what is tov? You should know this by now. Functioning in your purpose. Where you're supposed to be, doing what you're supposed to be doing. Doing what it's designed to do. The light was where it was supposed to be. It was doing what it was designed to do. Therefore, it was good. And where was it? It was summoned to appear and to be manifest in the midst of the darkness. And when he saw that, he said, that's katov. That's exactly the way it's supposed to be. So that's how it was in the beginning. How should it be in the end? 
that the light should be right there in the midst of the darkness, doing what it's supposed to be doing, dispelling the darkness. You prepare a table for me. Where? In the presence of my enemies. Not among my friends, but right in the middle of my enemies. I have said this many, many times for many, many years. When the creator decided that Abraham and his seed was to dwell in this place called Eretz Yisrael. He didn't call them to a land that was in some far remote corner of Siberia. He didn't call them to the tip of Africa or South America or the West Coast or the Northwest. He put them right in the middle of the earth, surrounded by enemies. I mean, what is the cardinal law of real estate? Location, location, location. And so when we're looking for a place to settle, we're not looking for the worst neighborhood on the block, are we? We're looking for the best. But what did he call his people to do and to be? Right in the midst of their enemies. Light in the midst of darkness. So when he saw that, he said, Kitov, it is good. It's doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's where it's supposed to be. And so then, again, where should we be if we are the light? Not hiding in a corner. There's this rabbinical notion that says that creation exists for the sake of those things that are first or the head. And they get the idea from the word brashit. If you'll see that, reading from right to left, bet, resh, aleph, shin, yud, Tav. But in the middle of that word, there's the root word, rosh, rosh, resh, alev, shin, head. And so what they're saying is, in this word, brashit, the very first word of scripture, there's this idea that, there, that the reason that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth is because he created it for a purpose. Again, the why, not the how, but the Why? And he created it for those things that are considered to be the first or the head, not the tail. And who is to be the head and not the tail? Israel, okay? Which you and I, through the Messiah, have become part of that family, right? So we're not supposed to be the tail. We're supposed to be the head. In other words, he created all this for us. For his people to be inhabited by his people where he would dwell in and among his people. The creation is the story of the birth of Israel. The people who, they inherited this task that had been given to Adam and Adam failed. So we, it, it, it ends up getting passed along to them. Because Israel was and is called to be something to the nations. Like, are y'all awake? Are y'all just listening real hard, huh? Okay. Am I confusing this morning? Okay, I want to make sure. So the Torah and, and the creation story, it's telling us about the birth of Israel and their mission, their purpose to be a light to the nation. It describes their mission in the Torah, to be a light to the nation. And again, that includes you and me if we come into this family. So all of this was created for the sake of all Israel. Because in the end, who dwells on the earth? His people. And he is going to be their God, right? And they won't even need a sun and the, all the moon. They won't need all that because the lamb is the light and he's going to dwell with his people. It will be inhabited by his people. Why? Because that's what he intended in the very beginning. So then, if he created all of this for the sake of all Israel, then he does not intend for Israel to be destroyed. I think he's proven that through the millennia. Has he not? Here's another concept we see in the beginning. He divided the light from the darkness. Why? So that each could function according to its own purpose. The Hebrew term, the root term anyway, is badal. Bet dalit lamed. This is the root for a word havdalah. Maybe you've heard of that. 
Havdalah is something that comes at the end of Shabbat when we distinguish between Shabbat and the rest of the week. We divide it. Because the week has its function, Shabbat has its function. And so it's very important to separate the two, to distinguish the two so that they're not, they're not overlapping and so that the week doesn't spill over into Shabbat. Because if that happens, then we're not doing Shabbat. It's not serving its purpose. So he divides light from the darkness here in the beginning so that light could function in its purpose. Darkness could function in its purpose purpose. And so there is somewhat of a separate existence. Let's put it this way. God did not intend for light to coexist with darkness. I think I heard that somewhere. Followers of Messiah are not to coexist with Belial. Wheat and tares don't coexist They are at odds with one another. They are at war with one another. And so then in dividing light and darkness and other things that we'll mention in just a moment, here's what the creator was doing in the very beginning. He's bringing order to things. He's shaping and forming. And in shaping and forming, he created boundaries, definite boundaries that were intended to separate things that he did not want to be mixed with the other. I'm going to see this throughout the creation account. Let me read verses 6 through 8. Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide, that same word, let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, Shemayim. And so the evening and the morning were the second day. And so the firmament, its its purpose was to divide waters above from waters below. In other words, again, established boundaries. And when those boundaries were in place, creation functioned according to his purpose. However, what happens when those boundaries are blurred or ignored or just erased altogether? Chaos. Chaos. When they're respected, life emerges and life thrives. Verse 9 and 10. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land Eolitz, earth. And the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was Tov. So then, it was on the third day that God caused dry land to appear, and he did it by gathering the waters together. And it's also on the third day that he called forth grass and trees that bear fruit, verses 11 through 13. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself, on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And so the evening and the morning were the third day. So, in the beginning, Brashit, that's the seed from which all things come. God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning. There's the seed. Everything comes out of that. Everything that's described for us comes forth from that. And so it contained everything. When he brought the heavens and the earth into existence, everything was there in order that what he had in mind, the shape and form and function, could all come to be. So I want to suggest this to you. Notice that it does not say that he created grass, the herb that yields seed, the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind. It didn't say that he made those things. It didn't say that he created those things. What does it say? He said, let the earth bring forth these things. I want to suggest to you that in a similar way that he summoned the light to be manifest in the midst of the darkness, what he's doing, he's calling forth to that seed that's already in the ground to come forth. When did it get planted? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and everything was there, right? 
So the seed for that grass, the seed for those herbs, the seed for those fruit-bearing trees was already in the ground. It had just been waiting. It had been waiting for the right season. Because when we plant in the ground, we have to write, you know, we, there are certain conditions that have to be there. When the ground's frozen, not the best time, right? But when the ground begins to warm and the seasons begin to change and we put that seed in the ground and it's good soil and it's watered and it's the proper season, what would we expect? At the appropriate time, the seed will germinate and that blade will push through the ground. I'm suggesting to you that it was on the third day that God called forth that seed that was already there. So there is what we see in the beginning. So what should we expect at the end? There's a prophetic pattern here. We understand that the good seed is who? Yeshua the Messiah. He is the word of God. He is the seed in the parable of the sower, right? And so he is what is sown that and goes into the ground and dies that it might bear much fruit. But you and I, being impregnated with that seed, the incorruptible seed, have been born again, and now we are the sons of the kingdom, according to Matthew chapter 13. We're, we're a personification, or we're a demonstration of that seed as well. So here's what I'm getting at. When Yeshua went into the ground to die and was resurrected, in terms of years, that was about 2,000 years ago, Right? And a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day, which means that about two days have elapsed, which brings us to the third day. And so what I'm saying is he is calling forth all that seed that's been waiting, lying, anticipating the appropriate season. When does he call forth and summon the light? It's when it's dark. It is my understanding that plants typically grow when it's dark. They receive the nutrients that they need from the sun and the soil during the day, but it's at night in the darkness when they begin to really grow. So look at the pattern. The waters are representative of the nations, and they're covering the earth, but then the creator gathers them together. And when he gathers them together, dry land appears, and he calls that dry land Eretz, which I'm going to suggest to you implies Eretz Israel. And this all happens on the third day. Remember Hosea's prophecy. After two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will raise us up. He'll call and he'll start calling us forth for that grass to appear, for those trees that bear good fruit to appear. All of this speaks of the restoration of Israel, a process that begins in the midst of darkness. So again, more than just being a history, the creation account is about why creation is. Not how, necessarily. I don't think we'll ever figure out the how until we get into the kingdom and he explains it all. And that might take some time, right? But right now, we can truly discern the why. Why he did these things. And the principles that are contained. The function more than the form. So on that note, let's, let's consider some other things. And we're not going to read all this. We don't have time. But the fact that he planted a garden and then he formed man. It is very, uh, in English it's not so obvious, but when you read it in Hebrew, it becomes obvious that before Adam was created, the garden had been planted. And probably somewhere close to the beginning. But anyway, before Adam was created. In fact, Adam seems, it seems to me, Adam was formed outside of the garden, then he was placed in the garden. Which even gets into the idea that, well, I don't have time to get into all that. <laughs> but my point here is, the garden had been planted. So then, if God plants something, here's what we see in the beginning, if he plants something, of course, it has a purpose, it has a function. But then he looks and forms and shapes those that he is going to delegate the responsibility to be the caretakers of what he plants and what he develops. 
And those caretakers, like we see with Adam, are to do the work and they're to protect that which has been entrusted to them, to tend and to guard. Because if they're doing the work and if they're guarding what they've been entrusted with, then it's going to function according to his design and according to his purpose. So if God planted a garden, that's what your Bible reads, if he planted a garden, it means it was a deliberate act on his part. This, he intended to do that. It's his planting. That's what I want to emphasize. It's his planting, and he planted it where he wanted it to be, where it needed to be, and then he planted the man in there to do what he instructed him to do. And if he planted the garden where he wanted it, that would imply he put it in a very important place. You know, like maybe in the midst of the earth. Maybe it's someplace he's going to watch over and keep his eye on. And he knew that if it were cared for properly, that it would grow and it would flourish. In other words, the ground would be such that when the people who inhabited the ground, when they were doing the things that were instructed by him being obedient, that that ground would respond to what they were doing. It would bring forth grass and herb yielding seed and it would bring forth grain and all the things that the earth produces. Of course, when they didn't do that, the opposite was true. It stopped doing these things. Anyway, if they cared for this properly, it would grow, it would flourish. And if he planted the garden, if that was his planting, then all those trees he put there, it would suggest, at least most of them, were in the garden according to his choosing. Consider this, John 15, verse 7 and 8. Yeshua said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, is my floor, uh, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. In other words, those the Father has planted, the people that God has planted, will remain prosperous. They will remain uh, they'll like, be like that tree planted by the rivers of water whose leaf does not wither and it renders its fruit in its season. They will produce the proper fruit and in producing that fruit, that's how they bring glory unto the Father. So we're talking about all these things that he did in the beginning, the principles that we see, the patterns and how we relate that to our time. And so if he has impregnated us with that incorruptible seed, it is inevitable that we are to bring forth the fruit that reflects that. If he has planted this congregation, then he has assigned people like you and me to be the people who do the work, who guard it. And if we do the things that we're instructed to do, it will thrive and it will produce fruit and that fruit will have seed in itself and it will propagate because he doesn't create something to be destroyed. Right? Right? And if he planted me and you wherever we're at, there's a reason for that. He had reason for where we're at, when, all those things, right? Because he's not the author of confusion. He's very deliberate in what he does. Are y'all still with me here? So being planted here, now, we're supposed to bring forth fruit. There is a different outcome, of course, for those who don't bear good fruit. According to John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and burned. Let me read that again. Every tree that does not bear good fruit, what happens to it? It's cut down, it's burned. In conjunction with that, there are some trees and plants that the Father did not plant. Because Yeshua said this in Matthew 15, verse 13. Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. So here's what I want you to meditate on for just a second. Yeshua says that anything his Father did not plant is going to be uprooted. Every tree that doesn't bring forth good fruit is going to be taken down, cut down, and then burned. That's either true or it's not. 
Now, when he said this in Matthew chapter 15, he said that in addressing the doctrines of men, which he said had made the commandments of God of none effect. And of course, through traditions of men, we get into mixed fruit, things that look good, but they contain evil. But the main thing I wanted to emphasize here is that there are plants, there are trees that God Almighty did not plant according to the Messiah's own testimony. That, by the way, and I'm not intending to get it too far into this, that's one of the reasons that I believe that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was a planting not of the Father, but of the adversary, because he does sow tares in the midst of the wheat, right? An enemy has done this. So there is this idea attached to that, that tares are not content to stay in their own field. When we had a house here in Cleveland, for a season there, I was obsessive about the lawn. I wanted the greenest grass, the plushest grass, and all this kind of stuff. The guy next door didn't care. And he had dandelions and crabgrass and all that kind of stuff. And I don't care how much money and time and effort I spent on having a nice lawn. It was going to end up with dandelions and crabgrass and weeds. And so I... <laughs> I took this away from that. Tares are not going to be content to remain in their own field. What do tares do? They, they do the same thing the thief and robber does. They come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The tares are in the midst of the wheat to steal all the nutrients from the ground, to kill the wheat, and to destroy the purpose of the field in the first place. That's what tares do. And who sows the tares? The enemy does. There are some things that God did not plant. So let's consider that there are things he didn't plant and anything he's not planted, anything that he has not ordained in time according to his timing is going to be uprooted. In the parable of the wheat and the tares, what happens to the tares? They are cut down, they're bundled up, they're uprooted, if you will, from the ground, and they are thrown into the fire. The same thing that happens to trees that do not bear good fruit. But the wheat, who are the sons of the kingdom, are then harvested and brought into the barn. So again, we see tares and wheat don't coexist. Light and darkness doesn't coexist. So let's recall some things we've discussed. Hopefully I'm going to tie some things up for you. The beginning contains everything that will be present at the end. In some way... Everything that we see going on today, we can find in the beginning because the beginning is a pattern for the end. He does not predict the end from the beginning. He tells us the end by telling us the beginning. And in the beginning, great darkness was upon the world. And so if great darkness is coming upon this world right now, we should not be shocked. We shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be rattled. Hurt, offended, saddened, angered, yes, but rattled, uncertain, no, no, fearful, no. Folks, if we have been planted here and now, and we're going to be in the midst of all these things that we've been reading about and hearing about all our lives, then we should, when we hear of these things, shouldn't be rattled by them. What did he say? There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. In Luke chapter 21, he says the sea and the waves are going to be roaring. The, the, the ground's going to shake. Men are going to be, their hearts are going to be failing them from anticipation, the expectation of the things that are coming upon the world because the powers of the heavens are going to be shaken. And then what did he say? Run for your life. No, he said, look up, lift up your head. Why? Because your redemption is at hand. This is all a sign that your redemption is at hand. That should encourage us. If we see all this darkness, and, and I don't want to belittle or, or diminish any of the things that are going on right now, that is not my point. 
my point is, all right, how are we as the people of God respond to these kinds of things? Because look, it may be in Israel right now, but what happens in Israel doesn't stay in Israel. So, more than a call of alarm to run and hide, it is an indication, the call for the light to come forth and to be manifest. I know that we're in that time because we're at the third day. Again, the day with, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. A thousand years is as a day. And it has been two days. So I know we're in the time. I may not know the day or the hour, but I know we're in the season. I can see the signs. You can see the signs. And those signs are there to tell us what season it is, what we need to be doing, what we don't need to be doing right now. I told you I might get a little extra long-winded today. I did put you on alert, right? Okay. All right, I'm going to say something. And I... I'm going to be as respectful as I know how to be. This big party that a lot of these kids were at, it was about 3,000 of them. And they called it a rave. And I, you know, a little bit of reading I did, they, they played this techno kind of music. They call it trance music. And it was advertised as um, a time of peace, free love, and fun. And I've heard different reports from people who were there who testified that you know, a lot of people were intoxicated, a lot of people were on drugs and things like this, and they were just there to dance and have a big time. Does that mean they deserve to be butchered? No, it does not. Because, you know, any of our kids or grandkids may have been at something like that. But here's my point, though. If we know the season, we see the signs, that kind of a situation and that kind of an environment is not the place to be when the devil goes on the rampage. Okay? That's what I'm saying. I hope you hear, hope I'm not being offensive to anybody, but that's exactly what was going on. And 260 plus of those young people were butchered some of them not even conscious of what was happening around them. That's how sad it is. We're not to be that way. We need to be sober. We need to be alert. If we see the signs, now is not the time to grow lax, right? Okay, Did it, I hope you received what I'm trying to say here. Again, I want to reemphasize. That does not mean that somebody deserved to be abuse like that. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that you and I, if we see these signs, we need to make sure we're not in the wrong place at the wrong time. We're called to be tov in the right place at the right time doing what we have been instructed to do, right? So I know we're in the season. We're at the beginning of the third day, which by the way, begins in darkness. And if we're functioning in our purpose, all will be tov. Now, the opposite of tov is what? Ra, evil, wickedness, which is something's not where it's supposed to be and is not doing what it's supposed to be doing. So in that light, let's understand that in the beginning, God ordained that man was to be a living soul, a living nefesh, more than just an existing being. Man was created, I believe this my whole heart, to live forever. You know, it was eternal life. That's why God breathed the breath of life into him, so that he would be an eternal being. But when man turned from what was good in order to partake of what was forbidden, that's when he was exiled from the garden. That's when he was subjected to all these different threats and all these different things. And, and why? Because man had decided to ignore the boundaries that God had set in place. Don't eat that. Why not? It looks good. I think it looks good for food. And it's something that'll make me, why shouldn't I be able to protect of it? Man ignored boundaries that God had set in place. And because man ignored those boundaries, he was forced to contend with things that he otherwise would not have had to deal with. 
and it's been hard ever since. God didn't wave a magic wand and make everything better. No, he said, you're going to have to deal with things, thorns and thistles and all this. You're going to have to deal with those things. <sighs> well, if that's the way it was in the beginning, that's the way it is now. God doesn't wave a magic wand and make everything better. He allows bad things to happen. Sometimes he orchestrates things. But in the end, if we believe that he is good, if we really believe that he is good, then we have to conclude that anything he allows, somehow or another, if we're willing to get on the same page with him, he'll work it out for good. Do you believe that? I'm going to say something that some may find a little offensive. As awful as the Holocaust was, it rendered something that may otherwise not have happened, or at least there have been a lot of people who would not have responded the way they did. Does that say, well, that justifies the Holocaust and it's a good thing? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that out of awful things, God can cause something purposeful to take shape. You believe that? Okay. So then, God allows these circumstances to touch our lives to, in, in the end, serve his purpose. And this is hinted at when he made man in his image. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 says this, that he formed man. And the word in Hebrew is yatzar, yud zadeh resh, yatzar. And that really means to shape and to mold. And so the idea I have in my mind is he's taking the clay and he's squeezing it and he's shaping it and molding it into the form that he intended it to be. And so at the very beginning, you know, it's a glob, it's a, you know, it's unformed, but God's working with it. And he's taking it and shaping it. And at the end, he's made this man in his image. And so then he created Adam by squeezing that clay into the shape that he intended. And so if that's what he did in the beginning, I recommend to you that's what he's doing right now with all of us. He's taking us and he's squeezing us and he's shaping us and he's bending us and all these different words that we can use to describe how we feel sometimes. But what's the purpose? To mold and to shape us into his image to conform to the image of the Son of God. And when his people at large are squeezed, the intention is the same, to bring about the desired result, which goes back to the why of creation. Creation exists for the sake of his people. I know this again may sound offensive to some. He did not create everything to be inhabited by wicked people. That might bruise our sensitivities and sensibilities, whatever the right word is. But the truth is, he created everything to be inhabited by his people. And in the end, that's what we'll be. When Adam failed in his mission, he was removed from the garden. Then God looked for another one. He found Abraham, and he raised Abraham up. And through Abraham, raised up a nation whose mission it was it was to be a light to the nations, and that's where we're at today. So let me ask you a question. You don't have to answer out loud. Do you believe that Israel, all of Israel, is to be a light to the nations today? Okay. You believe that? Okay, all right. You're going to answer out loud anyway. All right, that's good. <laughs> now, spiritually speaking, do you believe that Israel is in position to be that light currently? No, I agree. I mean, there are little sparks here and little flickers there, but at large, is all of Israel positioned and equipped and ready to be the light that we're called to be today? And if, that, if the answer is no, then something needs to take shape. There needs to be some squeezing and shaping and molding. Would you agree with that? All right. What happens when men ignore 
or when, when men try to erase the boundary that God sets in place? What happens when we determine that, yes, we have attained all wisdom and knowledge and we can coexist with evil and darkness and tears and all those things? What happens? Here's what happens according to the Torah portion, chapter 6, verse 5 and seven, through 7. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In other words, man was not functioning in his purpose. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. And so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. That's what happens. When boundaries have been ignored and when chaos threatens to destroy God's purpose. Because we need to understand the reason the flood came was not just to destroy the wicked, but it was to remove the wicked from the earth lest the earth reach a tipping point where it goes into a state of corruption and it is unredeemable. Before he would let that happen, he steps in he removes the threat so that his purpose can be continued. And that's why he had a man by the name of Noah who had three sons and their wives. That's why he told them to build an ark. That's why he provided a way of escape, so to speak, so that when the field had been flooded and all of the things that were oppressive and offensive were removed, he planted that seed back in the ground. That's what happens when boundaries are ignored. That's when... That happens, what happens when chaos threatens to destroy God's purpose. He intervenes. Sometimes it's from our perspective in a very catastrophic way. Why? And I'm almost done. The reason he does this is because what's written in chapter 6, verse 11. The earth was corrupt before God and filled with violence. It was filled with violence. Because when God's people ignore boundaries, when they ignore the divisions that God has put in place, and they start coexisting with tears and the philosophies and the ideologies and all these kinds of things, here's the result. Hamas. That's the result. That's the word for violence. The earth was corrupt before God and was filled with Hamas. Now, I know that the group in Gaza, you know, Hamas is an acrostic for, I think it's Islamic resistance movement or something like that. But he knows everything in the beginning. <laughs> he tells you what's going to happen in the end by telling you what happened in the beginning. And in the beginning, the earth was filled with Hamas. Why? Because men stopped respecting the boundaries that he had put in place, the principles he had put in place, and they just started doing whatever they wanted to do. And that is the result, Hamas. However, as in the beginning with the flood, God will preserve his purpose. God didn't create everything for the sake of his people Israel, and by that I mean all Israel, for Israel to be destroyed. He did not let them disappear in Egypt he sent someone to say, it's time to go. And when somebody wanted to hold on to him and said, no, I'm not going to let him go, he said, well, I'll see about that. Let me, let me show you what I can do. He has that power. He has that authority. And he has that will to do what needs to be done that his purpose might be fulfilled. And if he did it then, and he did it again, and he did it again, and he did it again, guess what? He's going to do it again. Right? He's going to do it in our time. He will preserve his purpose. He will say, here's what you're going to do. You're going to build this ark. And when you go in that ark, I'm going to shut the door and I'm going to watch over you through this whole thing. In the beginning, he uprooted the tares. Why? Because he didn't plant them. He uproots and he throws into the fire all trees that produce bad fruit. And so I'm going to suggest this to you. Where some people are seeing the world's events as speaking to the preeminence of evil in our day, I'm going to suggest to you that what we're seeing is the revelation of what and who is evil. Why? Because God's about to uproot some trees. That's what I believe. So I want you to consider the possibility 
that what's getting ready to happen in spite of all the awful, 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 awful things that have happened, it might be that God's getting ready to uproot some bad trees. If God allows hardship to touch his people, he always has a purpose so that we can all be shaped and molded into what he has determined us to be. So we prayed for, we prayed for our brethren who are in harm's way. We prayed for those who are being held hostage. We prayed for those who are going into battle. We prayed for those leaders, even in our country, that they would be guided by godly wisdom. I, I, I pray all of those things. I pray for all the innocent people who had nothing to do with this on both sides of the issue. But my prayer is that in the end, that all of Israel comes to the realization that good cannot coexist with evil. I'm probably gonna get in trouble with some, but Hamas is the result of coexistence. Hamas, or what they're doing right now. You know, Gaza, you know what it means? It means stronghold. That's what it means. Something with strength. And so the reason there's such a stronghold is because well-intentioned people, not just in Israel, mind you, but throughout the world, have had this idea that we can coexist with evil. Guess what? It doesn't work. And so Hamas is in a way the result of coexistence or this idea that we can coexist. Hamas is in some way failing to respect the boundaries that God has established. Hamas is evil to the core. It's violent. And in Bill's humble opinion, it needs to be uprooted. But here's what I'm really getting at. I have to be really careful how I navigate this. You ever heard the term Yesha in relation to Israel and the, the territories and such? You ever heard that term? Yesha, and it's a, it's a Hebrew acronym for Judea, Samaria, and Gaza. Yehuda, Shomron, Haza. And it would be spelled Yud, Shin, Aleph. Uh, excuse me, not Aleph, Ayin. Yud, Shin, Ayin, Yesha. Interestingly enough, Yesha is also the Hebrew root word that means to save. Judea, Samaria, Haza forms the root word that means to save. So what if I were to phrase it this way? Yuda, Shomron, Vehaza, or Judah, Samaria, and Haza. You know how I'd spell that? Yud, Shin, Vav, Ayin. Anybody want to pronounce that for me? Yeshua. Now, many years ago, the government of Israel decided to do, where, do what where Gaza is concerned. They gave it up, right? They gave it up. They turned it over to others. So the eyeing kind of dropped off. So all we have now is Yud Shein Vav Yeshu. By the way, that's how most Israelis, a lot of Jews, identify Yeshua of Nazareth, Yeshu. And it's spoken actually is a curse. They don't recognize him. They see him as Yeshu. So here's what I'm getting at. I'm going to go out on a limb here. Gaza has something to do with Israel seeing Yeshua and not just Yeshu. Now, I have no idea how. I wouldn't even begin to try to specify. I just, in my gut, I know that Gaza has something to do with 
that. Because we, we quoted Yeshua last week, you will see me no more until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Which is to say, you're not going to see me until you realize you cannot save yourself and you look to me as your redemption and salvation. Because what does Yeshua mean? It doesn't mean he will save. It means he saves right now. Salvation right now. So... So in the beginning, when men did what was in their own heart to do, you ended up with Hamas. But God said, I'm not going to let Hamas derail my purpose. I'm going to provide a means for you, those who have a desire to do what is right. An ark, Yeshua, a picture of Yeshua, if you will. And he is going to provide a way for all of Israel to see that Yeshua is the salvation of Israel. So I'm, again, I, I grappled with what to speak about. Didn't feel like it, we could just ignore what's been going on. But at the same time, I couldn't just take the path of, well, I felt like we as a congregation needed to kind of just affirm who and what we are and what, what the plan of action is is going before. Because again, it's not going to stay in Israel. This is stuff that's going to go on all over the world. And you and I need to be determined and just entrenched in the fact that when these things come to pass, we're not going to look down and we're not going to run in the corner and hide, but we're going to look up knowing that our redemption's at hand. We know that he goes before us he is our rear guard, and he will watch over his people. The guardian of Israel doesn't sleep. He doesn't go and slumber. He is always watching over his people. So we need to be in the right place at the right time, doing what we have been placed here to do. And the darker it gets, the more we need to shine, right? And the louder, uh, the louder those rockets from those who want to destroy his people are, the louder we need to shout and praise and sing unto the Father. Amen? All right. I've gone pretty long. Um, come on up here. Father in heaven, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as I prayed earlier, what I want your people to hear is what your word is to your people today. And Father, we do pray for those who are suffering, those who are in harm's way, not just in Israel. Your people all over this world are being persecuted. You have servants in every continent. Some of them are having to meet in secret so as not to be killed or not to be persecuted. But it's even, even in the midst of that persecution, they are pursuing you. They are seeking your face and they're growing and they're thriving and you're blessing and you're prospering them. So we realize we have brothers and sisters all over this world. And so we pray for all of them. We pray for us, that you will keep your hand upon us, that you will continue to guide us. And, and those who are in danger, those who are being held against their will, those who are just men and women and children trying to live life. I pray, Father, that through this, that you will bring the light of the Messiah into their lives. That through all of this, that your son will be lifted up and that your name will be sanctified in the earth. And help us, Father, as your people, to be a light to those that we encounter. That our brothers and sisters in this country will not give in to despair, but Father, we'll see that these are the indications that our redemption is at hand. So let us be strong in you, to be courageous in you, and not to fear or to dread the giants and the fortified cities and all of the strongholds of the enemy, but to know that at your word all those things collapse and they come to nothing. Help us to see and discern your will step by step, day by day, 